Welcome to another episode of Unbox Live. I'm your host, Rob Gagne. And I'm your other host, Nate Beck. Hey, welcome back. We are actually in the studio live with you. It feels good to be back. It's been kind of a while for us, so appreciate that. Uh, wait, did we do this last weekend? Or we did it two ago? weeks ago, but oh, you were uh, you had to be gone, so we did. Uh, we had some fun. Yeah, that's right. That's why it's been a while uh -huh. for me, but you were in studio yep. with Charles, mm -hmm. the other massively bearded dude, mm -hmm. which was awesome. The most epic beard. God, yeah. I remember seeing that yeah. guy from the first time, and I was like, is that a fake beard? Yeah, and That's we had gotta him, be fake. We had him. He's been on <laughs> twice now, both doing kind of cocktail and cigar pairings. And the first time he was on, somebody that was watching thought he had uh, a face mask on, and mm -hmm. then realized, oh my gosh, that's his actual beard. <laughs> it's a legit mistake. That is, you yes, know, not not an uh, not an, <laughs> not an exaggeration by any means. Nope, nope. So I'm interested. Obviously, you guys always know I'm always jealous of Nate's ability to taste cigars better than I. And I think I could work on it, but how do I get better at it? Because honestly, I don't make time for it. I really don't. I'm like, I'm not going to sit in a dark room. I'm not going to like, you know, start smelling a bunch of different things, but maybe that's what I need to do. Make I don't know. Make yourself a sensory box. Yeah. If you do will. I need uh -huh. to make a sensory box yeah. in order to get better at this? I don't know. I don't, I, to be honest, I don't know the path. And if you're out there and you're also wondering how the heck do I taste cigars better, then you're probably doing the same thing I am, which is basically nothing other than smoking just more and more cigars because that's always fun and that's easy to do, right? Yep. So we, <laughs> Nate and I had a really good time trying to find the thumbnail of this. We saw the episode of Psalm. Psalm, yep. Where they, yep. About they were- About and, and we tried to take a clip of that, but it just didn't work out. It was super grainy. But if you're looking at the thumbnail and you're going, why did they say this thing tastes like tennis balls and make it look like a cigar? It's because of that. You know, he's going through the wine it's and awesome. he's like, you know, it's uh, pretty acidic. It's pretty this, it's that, uh, you know, I'm getting real sharp, you know, um, freshly opened can of tennis balls. And you're just like, what? Fresh garden hose is another one that comes right after that. Yeah. What? <laughs> Freshly open can of tennis balls out of my wine. I don't know if I really want to drink that. Yeah. And it's very memorable in that movie. Like it's a, uh, he's kind of had a hard time living that down, but it actually, it's a flavor that you can get there. Like when you smell it, you go, oh yeah, I know what that tastes like. Yeah. And like my flavor profile of a cigar is like leather, spice, good, bad, yep. done. Yep. Like, so I'm not, I'm not a psalm for cigars. Definitely not. But there is a sense of like, okay, subjectively, I can decide whether or not the cigar is good or bad. Mm -hmm. But then there's objectively, you can decide what flavors are actually coming through. Um, and I think that's the part that I'm trying to figure out if I can be better at. Sure. So I reached out. In fact, when I was over in Germany, I ran into two people who are part of a basically a website called Cigar Sense. And that website really focuses on tasting cigars objectively as best as possible and then bringing the results to you and then trying to get that to overlap with your personal profile. And again, your profile is just matched to like cigars you may like. So really it's trying to take an objective look at the cigar, what does it have in it, and then move it into overlapping your subjective flavor profile it's a lot of science it's a lot of um you know obviously wow we could go really deep into that but what i want to do is spark the idea of like they're hosting a really fun really entry level tasting seminar where it's basically let's have fun with the cigar let's see what you know let's see what you perceive and let's compare it and then on top of it, let's see if you can, you know, win a grand prize to see if you can guess what everyone else would judge the cigar as. So nonetheless, let's bring in David and Franca. Thank you so much for joining uh, me and Nate today and, and getting our feet wet in tasting cigars. Thank you very much for inviting us. It's a real pleasure to be here. And it was great to meet you at, in, at Inter Tabac. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. No, that was a, a fun opportunity, especially at the Cigar uh, Journal Awards Ceremony. What a cool opportunity to be at that. 
I was having some but, significant uh, FOMO, uh, you know, not being able to be there because I love those interactions. Oh, I so. know. Yeah, I, I have FOMO of your tasting palate and you have FOMO of my <laughs> traveling. Okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, Franka, you and David started Cigar Sense just was i accurate in the description coming out like just to help people understand how their flavor preference will overlap with different cigars yeah that's right so um cigar sense was born to help consumers find the cigars that would suit their taste so we have to work on a personalized basis and on one hand bear into consideration, all the subjectivity, the term you were using before, of all the different members, while, um, you know, referring to a kind of solid benchmark that cannot be a subjective point of reference that we can use for the core profile of the cigar. It has to be something more solid. So we have to look for some method that would help us inform people um, about whether they will like the cigar or not. Um, you know, we see a lot of great reviews. I love the poetry, I love the magic. Certain people are really great. And all of these reviews are great uh, because they inform uh, about many different aspects um, the novelty of the product and everything. The only thing that they cannot do is tell each, cons each reader or each watcher or listener whether they will like the cigar or not. There you need to personalize the communication. And sure. so that's what we are there for. I love that. Yep. And it is truly almost like a at least for my website, uh, interaction, a lot of it is just like overlapping these kind of like flavor pies. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, it, a lot of it is taking the flavor wheel and saying, okay, how much of that is actually in the cigar? And so it might be a bigger bar into the toasted area and then it's a smaller bar. Um, elsewhere and I, I wonder if i can share this with matt so he can share it. but i absolutely love it because it's a visual i'm a visual learner i can see things much better once i look at them uh from that matter yeah and you know uh what is really fun and what makes it even a little bit more complex is that you know this is just aromas and of course flavors never come along it's always a combination of the specific descriptors and their intensities. That combined with tastes, tactile sensations, so what all what we sense in our mouth, combined with nicotine strength and a lot of other elements of preferences. You know, there's, um, there's the format, there is the wrapper, there is the price, there is, there are many more elements that make a person's preference um, altogether. And there are priorities for each of them too. So, you know, in the back end, it, it's kind of a little bit more complex than, you know, I like creamy and yeah, right. I want to see a big chunk of the pie that is filled in with creamy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, and you know, it's fun to work on that as well because it helps really understand others. You, you try to really look at, at it from another perspective and you just think, okay, who am I? That's my personal perspective. <laughs> With all respect for all the people who talk about cigars and who promote them, which is actually the the, the energizing the energy the, the the business so the the, the industry is great but um you know i since i've been working in this way i cannot talk about a cigar from my perspective only in public really i can share it with my friends but otherwise you know 
I don't know if those people I'm talking to have my taste and most likely they don't. Most likely they will hate the cigars that I really love. Yeah. So, you know, that has become really my, my way of being in the cigar world. <laughs> so you, you talk more, I guess, Excuse me. less subjectively and more objectively of the cigar if somebody asks you about it. Yeah, so when I record something um, or I write, uh, we publish analysis of cigars, it's always, sometimes it's kind of, it may get a little bit dry, boring, it's very thin, synthetic, it's, um, but we really try to leave emotions out of that. Because in the moment in which you start to put emotions, you do influence people in a more important way. Oh, yeah, of course, because nothing will sway a person to your perspective more than if they now tie into your particular emotion. And that's what's so it happens so regularly in tasting of anything, food, beverage, a meal. I mean, they say nothing ties you to memory more than your sense of smell. And so that, of course, then memory is tied to all that emotion. And it's tricky to go and be it's tricky when especially with friends trying to talk about the flavors that you get in a cigar, because you find yourself becoming emotional about certain flavors that make you feel uh, excited or nostalgic or, you know, what have you. And then pretty soon, if you're a person that's able to speak uh, you know, poetically suddenly they're like, Oh yeah, I get that. Oh sure. I taste that. Yeah. And then you're like, do you, do you really like, are you really getting that? You, you don't have to. Yeah. Yep. The power of suggestion is huge. Oh, when you're oh, yeah. tasting a cigar in a group setting, it's a yeah. extremely powerful influencer. I've, and, and not just specific to cigars. I've seen it also with wines and with whiskeys, you know, it's, it's, it's having a whiskey tasting as soon as somebody says vanilla, boom, suddenly oh, everybody, oh yeah, I get that. You're right. It's vanilla. Yep. Yeah. I think watching that when the, that short clip uh, of that Psalm, that first Psalm movie, uh, these two guys are, you know, it's the, they're practicing and kind of working through their similar, you know, essentially clinical tasting sheets and the speed and process at which he was going through color, clarity, viscosity, um, mineral, you know, flavor notes before he even tastes the wine. It's all so fast because they keep the emotion out of it. You know, they're just going on the sensory perception of the wine so that they can figure out what is this wine? Where does it come yeah. from? Where was it grown? And they leave the emotion out of it because it is purely scientific, you know, in a sense. And it's the same thing with cigars. I also yeah. noticed he would break down what he was trying to accomplish. So if he was talking about flavors, he only did that. And then he would, you know, do the wine, swish it and spit it out. And then he would hit flavors and then he would go back. He's like, okay, now I'm going to do, uh, was it mouthfeel or viscosity or something like yep. that? So then he would do it again and he would go, okay, that's medium. Yep. And I was like, whoa, like interesting to try to only break off so much of what your brain can fo like focus on at the yeah. time. Yeah. And then go back to it again and say, okay, now I'm going to try to do this yeah. mouthfeel or body. Where's that at? I had an opportunity with some friends uh, to go through a coffee cupping um, and, you know, coffee and tea, especially tea has even more. They have more flavor notes than really anything else that we can consume or perceive. And you watch a, a skilled coffee roaster go through that cupping and how quickly they rattle off flavors, body, you know, all of those uh, uh all those items they have to check off to try to grade that coffee to see if it's something that they want to produce uh, happens so quickly because otherwise they get lost in, oh, what do I really taste? You know, and then you start to think about what you feel about it. And then pretty soon you're distracted. Oh, yeah. The poetry. You get into the poetry aspect of, yeah. of tasting. Yeah. Yep. Well, let's dive into what you guys have to offer here on the 30th to us because I was immediately interested after talking to you guys like, yeah, sign me up. I'm ready to go for this because mm -hmm. this is the entry level point for me, or it is not a Psalm perspective. It's yeah. that I'm not going to be there. I'm definitely not interested in going super deep, hard in the paint, can't figure it out. And then I guess get discouraged and I'm like, man, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to smoke my cigar. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Matt, if we bring up the screen, I think this is the important part that I hear here is the main attraction. Here. Okay. 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 Do you guys have volume on your end? I'm getting feedback. Oh, uh, yes. Are you still getting feedback? So we we hear you a little bit through theirs, yeah. It might it might have yeah. just been? Sorry, I just didn't know what it was. So, anyways, it's the difference of others and why. So, really, all you guys are trying to do is bring a group of people together and say, "Hey, you're all going to have different flavors and different perspectives of this cigar. Let's call that out, bring awareness to it." And then I love the the second bullet point, which is hints on how to identify flavor notes when tasting a cigar. So it goes straight into like, you know, we'll help you a little bit. We'll get you a little bit of education here. And it sounds like from what I've heard, there's multiple different levels of people who join these seminars. Some very good, some very new, correct? So, uh, yeah, you know, and uh, in one way you said it correctly because it's an entry level uh, for the method for sure. Um, for to, to attend a seminar and feel comfortable is sufficient to know how to cut and light a cigar. You right. don't need to know more. It's just the experience that is important. And there's there's people of all levels. There's so probably there's not gonna be really uh, some of our panelists because we actually so one important thing is that this exercise is one of the many that we do with our panel as well. So okay. it is really conceived to help train, to help train. So doing it once will give a good idea, first of all, of the variability of the perception of different people together, right? Um, the discussion will not encourage to talk about what everybody is perceiving, of course. Ideally, we talk about some other topics and I always have some, you know, a few things that I can explain. <laughs> um, but then pretty soon we're going to cut a light. And then once the cigar reached the temperature, uh, the proper temperature, then, you know, we encourage people to start filling in the form. It's a not too long form. It doesn't even consider the tertios, the hypothetical tertios. So it's not something that we have to think of like, oh, there's a whole heavy, <laughs> rigorous technical tasting. Sure. No, um, it's up to us to decide that at a certain point, as we have smoked like half or whatever we decide is the good point, we uh, have described enough of what we have perceived of the cigar. Um, there's a breakdown in terms of what type of descriptor, so it's uh, aromas through the retrohale. So we forget about the raw tasting, the raw part, uh, before we light the cigar, simply for time concerns. Of course, it would be fun to include that as well, but yeah. uh, we try to focus on, uh, to try to make it not too, you know, not too tedious. Um, and um, and then we have, of course, tastes, uh, mouthfeels, and the nicotine strength. We really focus on the sensory aspect. So, construction, all of the other aspects which are very important in any other moment of evaluation are not taken here into account. Another important point is that we will not smoke blind because logistically we are not able to organize this for a wider audience spread all over the world. Um, it can be a small number of people. It can be a bigger number of people. We don't have any expectation, honestly. Sure. Uh, we zoom up to 100 people, so, you know. Um, and um, we, But we're used to working small groups like this, you know, when we did other seminars in the past. Uh, um, we're not scared by the small audiences. We're just used to them because not everybody finds it 
so important to to focus on these aspects of the flavor. Um, however, we found it important to bring the attention to why when we, um, when we confront ourselves when talking about the cigar with other people, we often do not match what we're talking about. And again, when we're trying to describe flavors of the cigar. Um, so the exercise really brings that up, really shows why, and it's very clear um, why that happens. Um, and, you know, the fact that it is um, one part of the training of our panel um, also helps us explain uh, what it takes to actually have a more objective um, view on a cigar. This is a small part of it, of course, but yeah. um, it's, it's, it's nice. It's nice to do it together. Um, and uh, the previous time in August, uh, people really found it very, very valuable and interesting to actually understand how you get to the actionable information for the consumer. So to the point in which there's a group of people who are aligning in terms of the descriptors that they get, the level of intensities that they get for each descriptor. And that is then what the consumer may consider as reliable information, actionable to help them uh, making informed buying decisions. So to really tell whether they will like the cigar or not, just based on a few descriptors, of course, and we don't want to make it too complex. We just focus on this type of descriptors here in the seminar. Sure. That's the hard part to me is like making it too complex. It's such a complex thing versus, you know, you then have to bring it into a sense of grasp. Like I can actually grasp this technique and focus on certain things. So I'm assuming that's exactly what you're doing with this seminar since it's a introduction to your guys' process. It's allowing me just to grasp a few techniques that I can practice on my own afterwards, correct? Yes, yes. And what you can do on your own are, um, you know, very, very common things like um, being curious about smells, especially smells. Smells are always the more complicated ones versus the tastes. The tastes are much more limited in number. It's easier. Um, the olfactory system is much more complex and memory and emotions help us a lot. Um, when uh, you are trying to be curious and you smell particular odors that you have in the and at, uh, in the house or you go outside in the park, try to associate it to a memory, a memory that is connected to emotions. Um, a barn with your grandfather in your happy childhood, for instance. Yeah. Uh, the, the leather chair where your grandmother loved to sit. These type of things help a lot. Um, and so that's important for the smells uh, because there are so many smells. Um, and, you know, train, there are these uh, tasting uh, training kits. Uh, we use aroma standards that I, um, that I prepare for the panelists uh, that have a cigar base because, you know, smelling cedar from coming, that comes from a, a perfume um, lab, smelling cedar when it comes from the cigar are two very different things. Sure. So the more you train to identify those smells as you, as closer as you can get, in the way you encounter them in the cigar, the better it is. Yeah. But those are difficult to produce also. Actually, I don't know where they would be sold. Um, really? And uh, uh, maybe it's a new line of business for us, but uh, yes. it's, uh, 
it's a whole different focus. So, um, so, but in any case, it can still help to train with those kids like Aroma, Ster, or Le Nez du Vin. Uh, they make them, of course, for all sorts of products, whiskey, wine, beer, chocolate, coffee, tea, and you name it, because the molecules in the end are always the same. Yeah. Uh, if you don't change the matrix, if you don't change the product base, like we do for the cigar and the, uh, and the cigar base in our aroma standards, then it's always the same. Um, so yeah, that, that's great training. And with those kids, you can also make some nice games with your friends. You can hide the numbers and you can you know guess and then see whether you got it right. And it's also another way to play. Um, and, you know, and then ob obviously there's the free Cigar Sets membership because we have all of those visual charts that represent the nose and the mouth perceptions. And you can always, you know, like a cigar, which you can find in our database, take your tasting notes. I advise people not to look at reviews at other people's notes until the cigar is off and then compare. That's I do that. Yeah, I do that every time. If I have a new cigar, I'll mm -hmm. I'll try to be as thorough, you know, cold draw, smoke as much of it, you know, kind of almost to like that last third where you're kind of really seeing if it had maybe two or three transitions. And then I'll make notes or kind of mental notes of what I think I taste. And then I'll pull up maybe a couple reputable reviews of ones because I know it's been reviewed and see it, where I compare, see if they're getting similar notes. And yeah. there are certain flavors that some people will perceive as one, but can be the same as something I figured out just based on, you know, their emotions, their place, their sense of memory from where they grew up. Those things can kind of cross over, but it's, it's more fun for me to try to see all right, this is what I think without the color of somebody else's perspective, because then, like you said, David, oh, this whiskey, I'm really getting vanilla or like toasted marshmallow. Oh, yeah, I totally get that. Now you've got some color that you're like, you're looking for those flavors. Yes. Well, when you compare your observations in the moment to what someone else has published, you have to recognize you have multiple levels of variability that factor into that. You have obviously you're smoking a different stick, maybe from a different year, even of production of that cigar. Plus you have the, the variability of individual perception. Uh, so you can never be shocked if what you perceive isn't exactly like some other reviewer. I yeah. don't think it's, well, you should view it as that's your goal is to be able to replicate what the professional reviewers say. But I do think this exercise that we do is really interesting because it, it gives each participant the chance to compare their perceptions to the crowd, if you will. And this is what these other amateur cigar smokers thought they found. This is what I found. Uh, and we actually even do a scoring. There's a bit of a, a sort of a contest aspect to this thing because we actually collect all that data. And at the end of the event, uh, we'll, we'll look at the scoreboard to see which individual participating best predicted what the overall consensus for that cigar was going to turn out to be. Interesting. That's I, I love it. And that'll be something that will be part of what we'll do on the 30th. Is that correct? Exactly. You'll see, you'll see that at the end of the event, we'll pull up what we call it the leaderboard. You'll you'll see how you scored relative to everybody else. And it's really basically just your, how divergent were your perceptions, you know, sort of descriptor by descriptor. So aroma by aroma or taste by taste. How much did your perceptions diverge from the group consensus? Yeah. Love oh, it. my competitive juice is already flowing. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm like, boy, if I get anywhere in the top 10, I'll be pretty happy. Uh, totally. I'll probably be at the bottom of the leaderboard, but you know, it'll be yeah. fine. And you know, I would just like to reemphasize something that, that, that Frank has said, you know, if, if, if you want to improve your skills, practice is the best way. It's just like any other skill. Your ability to name the sense, the aromas that you're sensing is something that, that, you know, everyone doesn't come out of the womb good at that. It's something that we learn and you can develop it over time with practice. So whether it's buying something like this Aroma Master sort of uh, kit of little vials that you can test yourself with, or even just, you know, vials of spices from your kitchen. Yeah. Uh, the key is do it blind uh, and keep track of, of, you know, are there things that you're struggling with? Like I really struggle to differentiate this category of, of aromas or spices and then practice where where i personally struggle is I, i'm pretty good at identifying aromas at what we call level one if you 
think back to that aroma wheel that you were, were sharing a moment ago, that the broad categories um, where I get a little bit sketchy is, okay, obviously it's wood, but is that oak? Is that sandalwood? Is it cedar? Which wood is it? Sure. And of course, our, that inner ring that you see there is what I'm referring to as a level one aromas. The, uh, the, the outer ring, ring is that one, yeah. Wood. Yeah, exactly. Spice, pepper, animal. And then the outer ring are the, what we call level two aromas that are you know, subdivisions of each one of those categories. And as you look at those categories, you can see some of those, there's a pretty broad range of things that categorize as toasted. Yeah. Uh, for instance, and a pretty broad range of things that categorize as spice. The, the one the that I that, always go after is that uh, the nut category. It's like, what nut am I thinking? Like, you know, it's nutty, but like, what nut do I actually think this is? I'm like, is it cashew? Is it kind of oily? Is it creamy? Is it more toasted? Is it have kind of a more raw bitter note to it? Uh, it, it, whenever I think of that category, I had, uh, when I was in college, I worked for a very short time, uh, in between two colleges I was going to at a company that literally roasted nuts and made candies for, uh, our local market here. And they would get in virtually every type of, you know, just beautiful, you know, cashews, almonds, all of this. And they all have very different aromas. And I still, when I think of some of those aromas, can picture myself walking by those giant vats of oil that were, you know, roasting these fresh nuts. It, it's, it's kind of, it's a fun memory for me because it's like, yeah. you know, those raw materials, whatever yeah. it is, uh, uh, to try to remember. And for me, I remember things in pictures. So if I have a set, a smell or a taste and I can place that with a picture, um, like a place, let's say like a vineyard or, you know, a barn, like your, you know, your grandparents farm, uh, those make those memories or those, uh, senses much more solid for me. Cause I were, I have a very distinct reference point for what that is. And I think that's Franca, what you were talking about. You have to have very clinical benchmarks of this smells like this, or this tastes like this. Right. Right. And we all base off of that. We're not basing off of what that smelled like at your grandparents' farm because nobody has an idea other than you and your family. Um, that's really interesting to me. Yeah. Um, yes, it's true that the more you train, and here I'm talking, I'm putting the panel leader hat on again. Um, uh, but the more we train, the more we really are have to be more rigid in terms of the common taxonomy that we use. Yeah. So, and that's why the use of aroma standards is important because what is cedar to you must be the same cedar to me. Mm -hmm. And that helps identify also cedars that are close to that, not exactly, but close to that. Yeah. So, what, what I, it, the rule of directionally correct and uh, better than precisely wrong applies here too, of course. It's better to say wood rather to say to try and, and go to a to a lower level of detail, which is higher level of detail, sorry, yeah. um, which which is wrong. So it's better to leave it as wood, of course. Now, in the panel, we do need to train to identify the level two, so the yeah. lower level of detail. Yeah, gotcha. Which is essentially the higher. So if I said wood, that's level Jesus, one. Actually. Yep. So <laughs> no, you see wood, then that's the second level. Okay, that's yeah, higher precision. That's right. And you know, one of the themes that we keep coming back to is really, really important is the the role of memory in your ability to name what it is you're sensing. So there's there's you know one aspect of that that's just you know your the, how acute are your senses? Can you discriminate? But then your ability to name that thing correctly, uh, memory has a lot to do with it. So. And you know, if you're if you're practicing and trying to develop the skills, and maybe you are looking for ways to attach memories to those particular aromas that aren't that familiar to you, I think cultural uh, background plays a part here. Um, I know in general you should avoid generalizing, but I think it's fair to say in general Europeans may be much more often exposed to hazelnut, for instance. Hazelnut. Right. Isn't a big a part of the culture in America. It's a huge part of the culture in Western Europe. Yes. Uh, so it's, I think it's generally very easy for people from France or Italy or Germany to recognize hazelnut and distinguish it from any of the other nuts. Uh, so, so you know, you may have, based on your cultural background, you may have some extra training to do to, 
to fill in some gaps. Maybe you, it's hard for you to differentiate cardamom from, from turmeric. Mm, you know, sure. If you're not from India, you probably can't immediately tell the difference between those two. You can tell they both kind of smell like curry. So clearly they're in the spice category. But being able to differentiate those is something that might not come naturally to you. You may have to really train and practice if you want to get to that level of precision. Yeah. One other thing that um, is also, I think, important is um, when we talk about common taxonomy, it means that we need to uh, talk the same language, even if our culture is different. And uh, for to that extent, um, it's it's not really advisable to use names of recipes that include different ingredients, different things together, and that might be known only in a particular region of the world. So, you know, uh, it's better for me not to describe a cigar with descriptors that talk about Italian recipes. <laughs> sure. Although they might be more known in the world, but uh, it's better not to risk it because I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, our, our, the phrase curry is a perfect example of that, right? Curry is an ambiguous, it's some combination of turmeric and cumin and coriander, but there are thousands of ways. Right. Yeah, and it's all regional. You know, that's one of those things like my family background is all Scandinavian in origin. And so, like you mentioned, cardamom, that's a huge uh, memory for me because so much of my uh, formative years were eating, you know, desserts and baked goods that were, you know, loaded with cardamom. Uh, my, I did not know that about Scandinavia. I thought you only ate lutefisk. <laughs> yeah, right. And lutefisk is actually, I enjoy it. It's, you know, a lot of the food, you know, things. Uh, it, it's interesting what we love or what we grow up with. Um, I was going to say my kids uh, keep our pantry stocked with jar upon jar of uh, Nutella. So uh, hazelnut is... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, is a, a very, you know, familiar, you mentioned that, but there are, like you said, certain foods that I think if there's like milk chocolate, that's something that is easily picked out in the United States, because we're well familiar with what a Hershey's bar tastes like, or, you know, the chocolate on a Snickers bar. Um, like, I know one of the things I often pick up in cigars as a like a sort of a gross sensory or flavor note you know very basic would be like either marzipan or uh, nougat in a candy bar that nutty vanilla almondy creamy kind of amalgamation of flavors that you go oh yeah i know what that tastes like in a snickers bar i kind of get those sorts of flavors here and then you start to whittle down all right which nut is it is it almond is it vanilla is it uh you know something else uh and then you kind of go from there. So it's, yeah, if you can kind of pinpoint that, it gets you in a ballpark to kind of get to that level two uh, sensory experience. That was the interesting part about the level two was, you know, Franco, what you said about, okay, don't pair it to something that, you know, might be a mixture of flavors. And I remember being in Germany this last uh, couple months ago and there was a pizza, hand uh, made pizza. They're all personal. And I ordered it mine and I go, wow, this is really good. Why do I think it's so good? So I started thinking about it. And I go, this reminds me of Chef Boyardee. Like the oh, sauce like from can. Chef Boyardee. Uh -huh. And it was great. It was way better than Chef Boyardee, right? Because that's canned sauce. But the flavor again, and, and the waiter overheard me. And he's like, you just compared uh, a really nice artisan pizza to a canned, you know, basically pasta and i was like well kind of not really like you know like it's more nostalgia than anything yeah it was yeah. like oh, this and, is and, yeah worst of all you're doing it in front of a real italiana <laughs> very much a big enough <laughs> pizza i'll see my name at the bottom of the leaderboard don't worry about it <laughs> <laughs> I have to. I often joke that uh, after eight years of, of living together on the West Coast in California, Nevada, we had to move back to Italy, mostly because of the pizza. Frankly, just couldn't <laughs> handle American pizza. Uh, being a real Italian, it's oh, a different okay. experience here for sure. Yep. So let's get back to the website because how do people get involved in this? This is super easy to get involved. It literally yeah. takes all of getting to the website, and I will say this: if we get to the home page. How do we drive to this actual login? Because I actually clicked, I think, on an, an ad. So just click on Cigar Sense at the top. I just want people to understand that filling out right there, that's not required in this sense for this seminar, correct? 
Yeah, that, that, that's correct. You have to register for the seminar from that page that you were just on. You can register for the seminar and where uh, do directly. You find that? Up at the top or where is it roughly? Um, that's uh, in the one of the latest posts, is it not? Yeah, you, you scroll down to the post. In fact, uh, we have a direct link uh, to the page of the seminars. Uh, and uh, virtual seminars um, are in the menu, in the top menu as well, no? Mm -hmm. So I is remember, it under If I remember correct, is it there? Is that virtual seminars? Is that one? Could they click that link as well under journal there? and get to the sign-in. There, there we go. Under the journal virtual yeah. seminars from the homepage. Otherwise, if you scroll down, there's some content and you get to the article where there is uh, exactly the picture that you were showing before. Sure. Um, so registration is obviously free. Is. Um, yeah. It is required because we will uh, need to fill in a form during the seminar that requires login. Um, so, but um, this means that you get the benefit of creating a free membership as well. You can practice before the seminar um, with your profile, with the various descriptors, etc. cetera. Um, so as soon as you register, you get an email with the Zoom link and with the cigar that we will smoke. So yeah. if you have the intention to participate, it's better if you register as soon as possible because then that will give you more time to procure the cigar. Um, we try to do our best to choose a cigar that is widely available. Of course, we don't know from what part of the world the participants will be. Um, you know, So hopefully you can find a cigar. Uh, hopefully you like it as well. <laughs> it can happen that you recognize you don't like the cigar. Okay, no worries. We'll organize more of these seminars with a different cigar every time. Um, you don't need to arrange with friends to make it blind, as we were saying. We, it will be an open test. You were saying something. Yeah. How often do you guys do this? It seems like the last one was in August. Now we're doing one... Um, at the end of the month here in October yes. 30th. So is it kind of like a every couple months, every month? If there's interest, we will. So there's been interest the back in the middle, but uh, if there's interest, we can do it every month for sure. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a good training, no? <laughs> yeah, and, an, and a fun community yeah. to, you know, to interact with. Yes. Um, palettes yes. and you know and senses from all over the world because of what we talked about earlier and what they bring to that conversation um i i think as a very curious person i think that's really interesting to to see other people's perspective and go oh i wouldn't have thought that or uh you know i maybe missed that and now i can add that to my you know kind of my encyclopedia of things that i can you know judge against or you know kind of compare against uh that to me is very interesting yeah, do you want yeah. To spoil yeah. the cigar to people, or do you want me to keep that hidden? Oh, you no, you can you can say it. You can say it. We are definitely doing the Placencia, mm -hmm. and this one is the Alma de Camp. How do you say it? Name? Alma del Campo Travisia. Okay. I would say Alma del Campo. Yep. Is that it? And I was very excited when I got the email when I signed up for the seminar because this is my absolute favorite cigar um i won't say this is this size is my favorite but this is the this is my favorite cigar to smoke on a daily basis so i was very excited so and i'm also a little nervous yeah because i think i have an idea of what flavors i get out of this cigar and what makes me enjoy it but i'm i'm curious to learn and pick up some new things that i might have missed or not paid attention to if i That's smoke awesome. it without you know intention i love it so um, what happens now that you told the name of the cigar is that people may go, people who have the intention to come to the seminar may think that they should not come unprepared. And so they're starting to maybe look for all sorts of reviews of the cigar to try and capture the best tasting notes. And um, so the seminar is exactly for these type of situations. Uh, and uh, also, 
If you want to refer to some tasting notes that you uh, want to consider as more reliable, put together many, many, many more together. It still doesn't make a trained panel, but you have the mass of right. yeah. that. Yeah, I'm so positive. just don't yeah. refer to one. Yep, mm -hmm. right. Yep. Perfect. And then you don't need to smoke the cigar beforehand at all. No. So basically, what you can do is go get the cigar, come on to the Zoom call on the 30th, and then you guys will run us through the whole cut light, what we're going to do, what we're going to start on, and when we're going to actually start perceiving flavors and aromas. Because we do want to get the cigar lit and obviously up to the right temperature to make sure that we're getting all the flavors out of it. Cause that's a part of it. You know, most people don't think that that smoke cigars, but it does take sometimes a quarter of an inch to an inch even to get that cigar going and, and, and fully expressing all of its aromas. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, as we start the seminar, then uh, we will introduce how it works. Uh, but Please do not uh, light and cut the cigar before the seminar. Uh, this is in order to be all more or less, of course, it won't be perfect, but more or less at the same stage of the smoking so that we can more or less end with everybody happy of having been uh, had the opportunity to describe as much as they could of the cigar during the, the time of the seminar. Uh, the cigar is not a very short one, so we will not be able to complete fully the, the smoking of the cigar by the end of the seminar for the slow smokers. For the fast smokers, it won't be a problem. All right. So do you I, I have one question. Do you recommend on the 30th? So the day of the uh, the seminar, do you recommend uh, going into the seminar, not having smoked any other cigars that day? Is that beneficial? You know, as somebody myself who smokes, you know, four or five cigars a day, uh, I'm perfectly fine to wait and enjoy just that one cigar when we do the seminar. Is that necessary? Do you recommend that? Uh, what would you say there? So this is one of many good practices that we could uh, talk about also during the seminar. Um, it would be uh, probably unfair for me to say, yes, you should indeed pay attention to this. You're correct. This is a perfect best practice. But there's many others. And if we really wanted to do it um, at a different type of level, like we do in our panel, then yep. it would be a totally different experience. It wouldn't be as fun, I can tell yeah. you. <laughs> uh, so ideally, ideally, yes, let's bear in mind that whatever we drink with the cigar will affect the flavor of the cigar. So ideally, uh, we don't want to, to drink something or even eat something that will leave a lot of flavor by itself um, over the notes of the cigar. Um, we prefer to drink water. We prefer to uh, not have eaten uh, some hours before the seminar. But, you know, there's a lot of guidelines that we could add, but we just make it more complex. So relax. Try to focus on the flavors of the cigar. And as such, it goes by itself, probably, that, you know, you haven't got your bags full of other stuff, <laughs> say like that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But if you do, well, then just have pleasure from that cigar, which is a great one. Yeah. Wonderful. Awesome. I appreciate that. That was a great question. I, I didn't even think of that. So uh, perfect. So if you want to get, more into this and signed up. Obviously, we'll provide the link. You can head over to cigarsense.com. Sign up. For, registration is free. The whole seminar is free. You just got to buy the cigar. And that's it. So plenty of time to get that cigar, whether you need to go to your brick and mortar or if you need to because they don't have it there, then get it in, in mail order. And uh, I don't know. I think that's it. I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to, to, to experiencing this. This will be fun. This will be kind of a first time experience with cigars doing this. So I'm excited. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm very excited too about it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And um, if there's any questions, of course, uh, we're happy to answer. I guess that we can still answer questions after the live is over.
Sure. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So if there are any questions uh, underneath, I'll be happy to review afterwards. And uh, um, and uh, I hope to see you all there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll be there. Bottom of the leaderboard. Bottom of the leaderboard, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's <laughs> got to take that spot. That right over here. Yeah, yeah. Right over here. <laughs> All right, David, Franca, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. And uh, as always, thanks for joining us for a Friday cigar smoking session. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone. Yep. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye-bye.